Hello everyone, uh, my name is Thomas and today I'll be presenting the culmination of my master's research which is on the 3D independent dosimetric verification of the excite lung tracking system versus the fiducial based target tracking system using patient derived respiration patterns in a real moving respir respiratory phantom. Now, stereotactic ablative radiotherapy has become one of the primary alternative treatments for patients suffering from non-small cell lung cancer. It's a highly precise form of treatment delivery involving extremely high biological doses of radiation delivered in only a few treatment fractions anywhere in the body. Now, due to the non-selective nature of ionizing radiation, as well as the very high doses that are used for stereotactic radiation therapy, any errors in the dose delivery can cause considerable damage to the healthy tissues, which will be non-recoverable. Consequently, these types of treatments require a very high level of accuracy, and this has been afforded by improvements to the accuracy of the radiation therapy equipment, as well as advancements in image-guided radiation therapy, which allow us improved localization for the target for target tracking. Now, in particular, image-guided radiation therapy means we can acquire images during treatment delivery to account for changes in the patient anatomy during the course of a treatment fraction. Now, the CyberKnife system is a frameless stereotactic ablative radiation therapy system which has a 6 MV mounted linear accelerator placed on the end of the robot with 6 degrees of freedom. Now this linear accelerator can be moved to a discrete number of nodes and facilitates non-isocentric treatment delivery from any desired angle. Now for this project we had available to us circular fixed cone collimators as well as the variable aperture iris collimator and we use the variable iris collimator for all treatment deliveries with collimator diameters ranging from 5 to 60 millimetres. You can see the collimator here. Now, perhaps the most important part of the CyberKnife system is that it's fully integrated with a diagnostic X-ray imaging system. So this consists of two amorphous silicon flat panel detectors seen here, each with an associated X-ray source, which are capable of acquiring images during treatment delivery. And these images can sort of feed back on a feedback loop to the linear accelerator head, allowing the position of the robot to be adjusted during treatment delivery to follow the moving tumour in the lung. And this allows for real-time respiratory tracking and compensation, which is known as the Secretive System. Now, the CyberKnife system in particular has two different methods of real-time uh, synchrony-based target tracking. The first is the fiducial-based target tracking method. Now, this requires at least one high-contrast uh, metallic marker to be inserted in or around the target in order to facilitate tumor tracking. And the tracking is based on the center of mass of this fiducial array. Now, when only one fiducial marker is used for the tracking, there isn't enough information provided by the position of that target, of, of that fiducial alone, to apply rotational corrections during treatment delivery. In fact, a minimum of three fiducial markers are needed to facilitate such corrections. Unfortunately, fiducial insertion procedures are invasive and are often done percutinously, and there's a high associated risk of patient-related toxicities associated with their insertion, and in particular, pneumothorax rates have been reported to lie as high as 45%. Um, in contrast to the fiducial-based target tracking system, we have the excite lung tracking system, which is a fiducial-free target tracking system which doesn't require any invasive fiducial insertion procedures. Now, in this case, the tracking is based on imaging of the soft tissue target directly, which is compared against the planning CT data set in order to determine the positional information of the tumour using sort of intensity matching algorithms. Now, in order to facilitate target tracking with the Excite system, the target must be adequately visualised by at least one of the X-ray images. In the case where it's not sufficiently visualised by either one or both of the X-ray images, we can still complete treatment delivery. However, in the case where we only have one view of the tumour, we have to add additional margins in the untracked direction to account for the uncertainty in localization. And with a zero view, we add margins in all directions. Now, very briefly, I'll cover the basic principles of synchrony tracking. So initially, orthogonal X-ray images are required either of the fiducials or the target directly, and these are compared to the CT data set, which you can see here, in order to acquire the positional information of the tumour. Now, at the same time as these images are being acquired, um, a set of external optical markers are placed on the patient's chest, and these are tracked by the synchrony camera, which uh, you, you'll be able to see in a moment just on this video here. Um, there we go. And the key concept behind this is that 
By acquiring a number of images in conjunction with tracking the patient chest, we can establish a correlation model relating the position of the patient chest to the position of the target. And hence, by tracking the chest motion of the patient, we can update the treatment delivery to track the moving target with the radiation beam. Now, the robot can be continuously moved to maintain alignment in this way, and further images are updated throughout treatment delivery to update the model about every 30 seconds to account for changes in real patient respiration. Now, there have been a lot of clinical studies on the fiducial-based target tracking system, and they all have demonstrated quite high survival rates and local control. However, in contrast, there's a lack of published results on, on the Excite system, these being two of the only studies I've been able to find, and one of them not even reporting on their local control. Now, there have also been a number of studies which have sought to assess the total tracking accuracy of the Excite system. Uh, this study here, conducted by Yang, utilised the log files generated from the treatments of 22 patients. Now, these log files have information such as the timestamp data of the robot and its movements and the predicted shield position, and the authors use this data in order to basically calculate that the target tracking errors with the Excite system were less than 4 millimetres in every direction. Other studies, such as this one by Nati Yar, who also looked at the log files, have found results consistent with Yang, and in particular, these authors found no difference in the tracking error between the two-view and the one-view Excite tracking modalities. Now, there is a fundamental problem associated with all studies of this nature, and that's the use of the log files themselves. Now, these log files are generated internally by the system during treatment delivery, and as a result, it's sort of like comparing the system to itself. It's a great consistency check, but it can't provide us with an independent assessment of the accuracy of the delivery dose. So we would like to perform an independent verification of the dose delivery without relying on any treatment parameters provided by the system itself. And this brings us to the main aim of the project, which is to provide a three-dimensional independent dosimetric verification of the Excite system compared to the fiducial-based target tracking system under realistic treatment conditions. Now, to achieve this, uh, we aim to compare the measured three-dimensional delivery dose distribution measured within the lung volume to the treatment planning dose distribution. And for the purpose of this project, all dosimetry measurements were carried out using gas chromic film, and this was due to its very high spatial resolution, making it highly suited for accurate dosimetry in regions of high dose gradient, which is characteristic of cybernite-based treatments. Now, for all treatments uh, using the CyberKnife system, we use the Quasar Respiratory Motion Phantom, uh, which you can also see just over there. Now, this phantom comes with a body to simulate the patient torso and space for two inserts. Now, into one insert we place the surrogate lung, and into the other insert goes the driving motor. The, the surrogate lung provided with the respiratory phantom only allows for measurement of the dose in the central 2D plane, comes with a target for target tracking, and in particular, this motor here can be programmed with real patient respiratory data, like the breathing trace you see here, to replicate real patient respiratory motion. Um, and for this project, we use a single anonymized patient respiratory trace for all of our treatment deliveries. Um, we also have this chest platform here that simulates the patient chest motion. Now, in order to facilitate real-time tracking using this phantom, we actually needed to make a number of modifications. The first was to create a realistic 3D printed patient spine to add to the phantom. Secondly, we needed to add bone equivalent ribs and a sternum. And lastly, we had to construct a custom lung insert to allow for 3D dosimetry. So firstly, we needed to produce a material that was equivalent to bone in order to simulate the scatter and attenuation conditions created by the real bony structures in a patient. So for this purpose, we used Uracil 10 Orange, which is commonly used to make ballless material, with the addition of a plaster of Paris suspension. Now, basically, we took six different samples of this uracil orange and added varying amounts of plaster in order to determine a relationship between the amount of plaster added and the electron density in terms of the CT number. And using this, we can effectively prepare a flexible bone equivalent material with any electron density that we require. So following this, we needed to create a 3D realistic patient spine. Now the reason this is so important is because immediately prior to treatment delivery, we can apply translational and rotational corrections to the patient's setup based on rigid matching of the bony vertebrae structures in acquired images 
compared to the CT platinum data set. And this is particularly important for one fiducial tracking where you would not otherwise be able to apply rotational corrections. Now, to achieve this, we acquired the CT data from a real patient's thoracic spine segment from Embody3D, which is an open source biomedical 3D printing database. And we printed this in polylactic acid, hollow and in two halves, as you can see here, allowing the bone to then be filled with our bone equivalent material, which was made with a CT number of approximately 250 based on a study into the vertebral densities by S. Patel. And here you can see the CT scan of our final setup showing the spine lying behind the lung volume. Following this, we needed to add a sternum and a set of ribs to the lung phantom. The reason we needed to do this is to replicate the obscuring effect of the bony structures on the target. This is particularly important because it could lead to errors in the target tracking accuracy of the excite system as opposed to the fiducial based system. So this effect is illustrated here for this anonymous patient CT scan where you can see the ribs are obscuring the tumour from vision and this is how we've tried to replicate the effect on one of our images of our phantom. Now following this, we designed our custom lung insert to allow for 3D dose symmetry measurements to be made. This basically consists of 15 alternating layers of stacked gas chromic film and a corrugated plastic material which is close to air. Um, and these were stacked up rigidly within the lung insert. And in particular, the target for tumour tracking was constructed by taking circular cutouts out of some of the central layers and filling these with our bone equivalent material, although this time we made it with a lower CT number to simulate our target for target tracking. Now, now that we have the phantom prepared, we need to plan all of our treatments for delivery. So all of the treatments were planned using the Cybernife inhale exhale protocol. And in particular, the exhale CT scan was designated as our primary reference upon which the dose was calculated and registered using Monte Carlo dose calculation with a 1% uncertainty. Now, in total, we used two different phantom setups. The first did not allow any rotation of the lung insert, and so there was only target motion in the superior inferior direction. The second um, uh, phantom setup did allow for rotation, and consequently was capable of simulating anterior, posterior, and left-right target motion as well. Now, it is important to note that all treatment plans for the same setup use the same CT data set, so that all the treatment plans were as comparable as possible in their treatment delivery. Now, the dose prescription was based on 54 grays delivered over eight fractions, and consequently, we prescribed a single fraction dose of 6.75 gray to the PTV. Now, during treatment planning, we updated our prescription point based on the PTV dose volume histogram, seen here in purple, in order to ensure we had a minimum of 95% coverage to the PTV for all of our treatment plans. In practice, this translated to a dose of 6.75 gray prescribed to the 71 to 73% isodose line. So, a total of nine treatment plans were prepared with the help of experienced radiation therapists here at Sir Charles Gardner. And in total, we had three treatment plans using the setup without rotation. So a static fiducial delivery, as well as tracking utilizing three and one fiducial, all with five millimeter isotropic CTV to PTV margin. And then for the setup that did use rotation, we have all of our excite based deliveries, as well as we also repeated the one fiducial synchrony and the fiducial static delivery. Now, the only treatments that didn't use a 5mm margin was the Excite 1 view and 0 view, where we had to add additional margins in the untracked direction, as, as discussed previously. Now, once the treatments were planned, we need to be able to reconstruct the 3D delivery dose reconstruction, and to achieve this, we wrote an algorithm in the MATLAB software, which basically uses the dose information provided by the 15 layers of gap chromic film to interpolate the entire 3D dose within the lung insert. So, firstly, after treatment delivery, each film layer had to be digitized using the Epson Expression scanner, which allowed us to extract the red channel response for each of the film layers. Then by applying an appropriate film calibration, we can get the dose information associated with each individual film layer. However, when scanning the films, it's not reasonable to assume that we can scan every film in the exact same orientation. Um, and in order to precisely crop the film to include only the film area, this is essential. So consequently, as each film layer was read into MATLAB, we wrote an algorithm to correct for the angle such that each film would be normalized to lie at zero degrees with respect to the horizontal. We achieved this 
by taking the taking a rough crop of the bottom cut factory edge for each film layer as it was read in, and then we took an, a, a vertical intensity profile for every column. Then by finding the central point of this vertical intensity profile and plotting a line through all such points, we could get a nice line that represented the edge of our image, work out the angle and use this to correct and crop the image as you can see here, such that we now only have the film layer for interpolation. Following this, it was also necessary for us to align each of the film layers relative to one another exactly as they were doing treatment delivery. This is a really important step because it's very important that we ensure that the assumed positions of the film within MATLAB for reconstruction is not different to how they were aligned during treatment delivery. Um, in addition, as not all film layers were the same size because our insert is circular, we had to add zeros to the edges of the smaller pieces of film to match the sizes of all the films. These weren't used for any interpolation, but they did serve as spatial placeholders to make sure all the dose was put in the right spots. So the setup we use to align the films is shown here, and basically what we did is immediately before each treatment delivery, when all the films were stacked up within the lung insert, we used a 5mm stereotactic collimator to irradiate a single beam at the top and the bottom of the lung insert, as you can see here for the dose on the exposed film, um, in order to align the films. And basically the key concept is, because the beam is perpendicular to the film plane, the centre of these circles will lie in the same position on every single film layer. Then, by, by finding the equation of a line, which connects the center of these circles, we can effectively wriggle all of the film layers in MATLAB so that, that line lies at the exact same spatial coordinate, and then we can be confident that our dose reconstruction, our films used in the dose reconstruction are in the exact same orientation as they were during delivery. With this done, we can now reconstruct the entire 3D dose distribution. So this was achieved by looking at a particular pixel IJ in one of the film layers, and then you can imagine drawing a vertical line which passes through that same pixel in every single other film layer. This provides us with 15 data points which we can use to interpolate the dose along this line and repeating for every pixel we can fill in the entire 3D dose distribution. This particular dose matrix here contains about 15 million data points. Um, we actually found as well that polynomial interpolation of order 9 was necessary to recreate the accuracy in the resulting dose distribution. Once we have the dose reconstructed, we now need to spatially match that dose distribution with the treatment planning system dose so we can directly compare these two dose distributions. Consequently, we have to make them the same resolution. So after the raw treatment planning dose distribution was extracted from the Dicon RT dose file, it was imported into MATLAB and scaled to the same resolution as the delivery dose distribution. The reason the scaling was done this way is because we found at higher resolution we had less error due to pixel binning effects in our resulting comparison. Now, following this, it was necessary for us to crop the treatment planning dose distribution so that it would lie at the exact same spatial coordinates as our delivery dose distribution. To achieve this, we took four circular copper markers that were 0.2 millimeters thick and embedded them within the central film layer, as you can see in the corners here. Now this film layer was placed into the lung insert during the acquisition of the planning CT scans, and the coordinates of these can be easily identified from the CT scan, which is registered with our dose distribution. Similarly, this piece of film was used as a template to make a mark on all of the delivery films in the exact same positions as these coordinates, such that we can then identify these positions in the resulting reconstructed dose distribution. Then, by matching up these two dose distributions based on the average location of these four reference markers, we can match the planned and the delivery dose distribution. In this way, we can detect any systematic errors in the delivery dose distribution. And with these dose distributions now spatially matched, we can directly compare the two using the gamma map dose comparison. So here we have the delivery dose on the left and the planned dose on the right, and I've indicated where the GTV is in the planned dose distribution. Now, we wish to compare this dose distribution to this one, and to do this we'll be using the gamma map dose comparison. Now, this basically requires the user to specify a dose tolerance and a distance to agreement. 
And based on these parameters, you want to compare each pixel in this distribution to the corresponding pixel in this distribution plus the region encompassed by a circle equal to that distance criteria. And basically, you can calculate the gamma, um, the gamma score for each point in this distribution, and the lower the gamma score, the better the dose agreement between those two points. The standard criteria used is 3% at 2 millimeters, and that's what I'll be focusing on. So for each distribution, we've generated a gamma map. So basically, this is a plot of the gamma value for every single point in three-dimensional space, excluding all the dose points less than 10% of the maximum dose, as these points carry a high error. So we can basically see that all the points less than one are considered sufficiently similar to one another and have passed the gamma criteria, and all points greater than one, shown in green or red, have failed the gamma criteria. And we're interested in the percentage of points which pass the gamma criteria. So for this treatment delivery, this was the no rotation phantom setup, a static delivery using three fiducials for positioning. We had very, very good gamma agreement, as you'd like to expect for a static delivery that had no synchrony tracking. Following this, we completed the three fiducial synchrony based delivery, so we now have target motion and target tracking. As you can see, the 3% 2 millimeter gamma pass rate degraded significantly. So, as a result of the synchrony tracking, we get about a 5% reduction in the dose agreement between the delivered dose and the planned dose, and the gamma map is shown here. Now, the dose agreement failed predominantly in this high dose region, and the reason for this is actually, if you look at this dose scale, you notice that the dose we delivered is actually a lot hotter than the dose we planned. In this central region, it's about 50 to 80 centigrade hotter throughout the central region, and this was quite consistent for a lot of our treatment deliveries. So next, we have the one fiducial synchrony treatment delivery for the setup with no rotation. And surprisingly, this actually outperformed the three fiducial delivery. We only had a 97.82, we had a 97.82% gamma agreement. Now, for this particular phantom setup, we have no rotation. So consequently, the advantages offered by three fiducial tracking um, are not so significant because we don't have any rotation. So the advantage of being able to apply rotational corrections doesn't really matter so much which is possibly one explanation for why the one fiducial seemed to outperform three fiducials in this case. Um, I believe personally that the three fiducial system was attempting to correct for rotational corrections that didn't need to be corrected for and effectively overcompensated, which degraded the resulting dose distributions. Now, following this, we have just another static delivery for the phantom setup with rotation. Um, again, the dose distribution for this static delivery, the agreement was worse but it's still above sort of the cutoff of 95%, which you'd like to aim for. Um, however, the one fiducial synchrony tracking, when we added a component of left, right, and anterior, posterior target motion, was significantly degraded, obviously, because with one fiducial tracking, you cannot account for rotational errors in the treatment delivery. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete the three fiducial synchrony tracking for this setup because it was exceeding the rotational tolerance of the system. Now, what this basically says to me is we couldn't complete the three fiducial delivery because the error was too high. However, for the one fiducial delivery, which had no notion that this error even existed, the treatment was allowed to proceed, and consequently, we have quite a poor dose agreement. Um, next is the Excite 2 view static delivery in order to serve as a baseline to which we can compare the other dose distributions. And this gamma agreement was again very, very good. Following this, for the Excite 2 view, the dose agreement was about 93%. And again, we have dose failure in this high dose region due to delivering hotter dose than we planned. Now, funnily, the one view actually outperformed the two view. Um, and this could potentially be due to differences in the target localization accuracy afforded by the two different cameras. Um, and it's actually consistent with the results by Nakayama et al. I mentioned previously that found that the one view and the two view have very similar accuracies in their target delivery. But it is important to remember that the one view has larger treatment margins and has more healthy tissue dose for the patient and more adverse health effects associated with it. Lastly, we have the zero view which had a very poor dose agreement. Um, the target here is shown just to show you where the target would lie if we were tracking, um, because in the case of a zero view, we have to treat the whole treatment area because we can't track it if we can't see it. We're just targeting, treating blindly, basically. 
And you can see we had a massive failure in the dose agreement along this side here. And what I think happened is basically around the 15% isodose level, the dose in our delivery dose distribution sort of bled and we got more dose in this sort of low dose region and the gamma result was pretty miserable as, as, as a consequence. Now, um, this is actually how you would treat um, a moving target conventionally in a linear accelerator, which is nice for comparison to see how much larger the target area actually is. So, all of our dose calculations were performed using Monte Carlo calculation, um, and we wanted to assess the error in the agreement between the treatment planning dose and the delivered dose that we could get purely due to the variance in the calculation of the, of, the, of the treatment planning dose distribution. So for one of our treatment plans, we repeated the dose calculation in the treatment planning system three times and compared each of these to the delivery, and we actually found the standard deviation to be very, very small. So the error from the dose calculation algorithm is unlikely to influence any of our gamma results. Now, for, to, to conclude, um, as is evidenced by the excellent gamma results from the static deliveries, we've been able to accurately reconstruct the 3D delivery dose distribution, which is the first time this has ever been achieved. Um, it's hoped that with further refinements, this method of 3D dose symmetry could be more practically implemented for the quality assurance of maybe very complicated cases or for commissioning purposes. Secondly, we note that points generally failed the gamma comparison in the high dose region because they were too hot. We believe this could potentially be due to scanner uniformity effects, as by taking measurements of the scanner, we found our scanner was, under was, sorry, was overestimating the dose in the central region by about 4%. However, these results were taken on two different scanners and the results were very similar. Um, we saw the same thing. So we decided this could also potentially be due to a limitation of our phantom. So our phantom is actually quite short, which means that some of the beams which were planned to pass through patient, the patient body as the lung insert is moving and the target is moving, these beams might instead pass through air and consequently that would be attenuated less, resulting in a higher dose in the target. Now, in the case where there's no rotation, we found that the one fiducial tracking actually exceeded the three fiducial tracking and this seems to support the notion that the benefits offered by using three fiducials over one fiducial do not outweigh the adverse health effects associated with simply putting the extra two fiducials into the target to track the target. Um, in addition, we noticed that the one view tracking and the two view trackings in the high dose region were very comparable with the one view actually outperforming the two view. And as I mentioned earlier, this was consistent with the findings by Nakayama. Lastly, with the exception of the zero view tracking, the accuracy of the excite lung tracking system compared to the fiducial based tracking system was found to be comparable and even exceeded the fiducial based tracking system for treatments with the same treatment margins and phantom setup. Now, there are some pre premises for future work based on this. Firstly, I'd like to compare my 3D dose reconstruction algorithm to gel dosimetry, which is the only true 3D dosimeter available at the moment. Um, and I'd also like to work on developing a user-friendly software and a simple phantom to allow for its practical implementation. Secondly, I'd like to take repeated measurements with more patient respiratory data, if time would allow, with the ultimate goal being to identify predictors which we can use to determine which patients might benefit the most from each of the different target tracking modalities. And lastly, I'd like to apply this 3D dose symmetry method to other treatment sites, potentially such as the brain using a realistic head phantom. Such references and thank you for your attention. I'd like to offer special thanks to all of these people, in addition to all of my supervisors, of course, who have helped me throughout this project. Um, we haven't um, been able to assess the GTV coverage for these treatment deliveries. Okay. Um, we could theoretically uh, extract this information from the treatment planning system, but it would be sort of a whole nother analysis that would take quite a long time. Um, and it's possibly something we could look at doing in the future, actually. Okay.
to base your comparison on the Fermi index. Yes. Um, what would you say the limitations of Well, one of the major limitations of the gamma index is when a point fails the gamma criterion, um, you don't know if it's failed because it's exceeded the dose tolerance or because it's exceeded the distance tolerance. So the user specifies a dose and a distance, and if a point passes, it basically means it found another point in the reference dose distribution to which you were comparing to, which was within the dose tolerance, within the distance specified. So this point doesn't have to be within 3% of the exact same point. It could be within 3% of a point one millimeter away if your distance tolerance is more than one millimeter. Um, so it's quite obvious in our distributions that the points failed due to the dose because the dose was hot. But if the dose wasn't hot, it actually would have been almost impossible to determine if it was because of distance or dose. Um, <coughs> so in, in stereotactic treatments like this, yep. how, how would you uh, weigh up the importance of dose accuracy against geometric accuracy? Uh, do you mean the dose accuracy in terms of where the dose, well, the, 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 the geometric accuracy in terms of target localization, effectively. Um, well, the geometric localization is actually what, what is assessed from, from, from the log files, whereas the dose accuracy is actually what you're delivering to the patient. Now, the geometric accuracy is probably very important as a means to ensure the dose accuracy is as accurate as you can possibly get, because at the end of the day, the dose accuracy is what you're delivering to the patient. I think that should be what what you're interested in assessing, that if we plan a particular dose distribution, is that exactly what we're going to be delivering? And I'll tell you what our question will be, is it more important to get the dose in the right spot, or is it more important to get the right amount to a spot? Um, it's probably more important to get the right amount to sort of your PTV. Both. Like, both, yeah. <laughs> like, you, want, you want both, but um, I, I, I suppose it, it really, it really d depends. Um, I reckon the spatial accuracy is probably more important in a stereotactic type setting because your treatment margins are so tight. You don't use a GTV to CTV margin um, because you just need the delivery to be so precise. If your delivery is off, your dose is going to be in the wrong spot and you might still get the right dose to some of it, but you're going to miss target coverage and that's going to sort of be a, be a centre for, for, for regrowth of the tumour. So I actually think the spatial accuracy is the most important in stereotactic, but obviously both are, go hand in hand. Yeah, Um, I think it would be beneficial to perform measurements in the brain because of how highly precise um, stereotactic treatments of the brain need to be. Um, in addition to the fact that you can have multiple scattered treatment sites, which is pretty pretty difficult to assess without without being able to actually look at the full um, reconstructed distribution, I think that could provide a lot of insight to to, to doctors and planners. Um. So, using this framework for brain, or you use um, using the same sort of um, methodology behind reconstructing using gas chromic film, but um, obviously we need to design a new phantom for for the brain. Okay, because the brain tumors are going to be... Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in terms of stuff, you're going to be impacted by... Um, but the spatial resolution is very, very high, and the, the resolution of the reconstruction is only limited by the resolution at which we scan. Um, so as, as I said, we have 15 million data points in our reconstructed dose distribution. Um, the pixel spacing is very, very small. Um, so... Um, if you, you know, you're binning two pixels, if you end up binning one pixel to the right of where you should be, your error is, is about 0.1 millimetre, like at, at the most from, from something like that. Thanks so much.